Hi all, welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name is Ivana, I like to read, and today we're gonna talk about some books that I have read recently. Though it hasn't really been that recently because these are books I read in April, so two months ago. We are gonna do the best we can. April is a mixed bag. I read from all sorts of genres. I was able to read nine books. The categories this month are women in translation, literary fiction, romance, fantasy and i have one non-fiction book so there's a big variety and hopefully i can remember everything i read and talk to you about it luckily i have my reading journal with me that is going to help me it's going to be my lifeline <laughs> so let's get started with women in translation so in this month i read two books that were translated into English. So the first Women in Translation book that I read was The Elegance of the Hedgehog by Muriel Barbary. This book is set in France. It was originally written in French in the year 2006. It's also been adapted into a film that actually genuinely looks really cute. I have stills from it in my journal. I'll show some somewhere on the screen. It follows Renee, who is a curmudgeonly middle-aged woman who is the concierge of this fancy apartment building in Paris. And it also follows a precocious 12 year old named Paloma who is a resident of that apartment building and she is really really bright and funny. Actually they both are. It's told in alternating points of views and you get to read each other's thoughts and you get to learn all about Renee and her life and her cat and Paloma and her tween ennui. She's an old soul. Paloma has a mind journal and a body journal I think. Like she talks about issues of the mind and she has profound thoughts. Both Paloma and Renee are very, very clever. They're very learned and they basically hate people. They would rather keep to themselves. They feel misunderstood and all of that comes to a head when the apartment complex gets a new resident, a Japanese gentleman named Ozu. Renee, the concierge, ends up getting really close to him and Paloma is intrigued and she wants to know why. I really enjoyed this book, especially in the beginning. I thought that it had a lot to say about life and its purpose. I thought that it had many moments of comic relief. I liked that it included cats because Paloma also has cats. I loved the side characters. Renee's BFF is a Portuguese housekeeper and she's really funny too. I like storylines where there's a kid and an older person and they manage to somehow really understand one another in spite of everything, in spite of being so different. I started this one physically. I feel like most of what I did this particular month was listen to audiobooks, but I switched over to the audiobook and at the end it felt a little bit too long. So I feel like it dragged out a little. I sort of wish that it were a novella or at least I feel like it's not even 300 pages. Okay, it's 325 pages. I wish it was like 250 pages, but other than that, it was it was really enjoyable. It was fun. So the next book that I read that was a Women in Translation book was The Felt Like Stars from the Sky and Other Stories by Shika Halawi, who is a Bedouin Palestinian woman who originally wrote this in Arabic. The book comes with gorgeous illustrations. They're like very simple. I don't know if the camera's focusing, so I'll just show you some somewhere on the screen <laughs> again. I think this is a quick and easy read that also packs a punch. There's 18 stories in 104 pages, so it's a very quick read that is also very enjoyable. So I talked about this book in my spring vlog and I literally found it by googling like women in translation books out in 2024. I've been attempting to read 24 women in translation in 2024 and I was noticing a trend in the types of books that I was reading. A lot of them were translated either from Japanese, Italian, or French so I wanted a little bit of variety and this book happens to be in Arabic like I said and I wasn't expecting much of it. So Sometimes I borrow books from the library that are short story collections and I don't end up reading them because short story collections can be very inconsistent. I felt like this collection had a blend of humor, spunk, some processing of trauma and of survival. The stories were feminist. They were light even when they talked about issues that affected women. I read this book in two days. I strongly recommend it if you're looking for something quick to read. Back to the lightness, I feel like oftentimes when you read stories from people from certain backgrounds, especially people in marginalized communities, a lot of the stories tend to feel really heavy. And as they should be, I feel like we shouldn't look away from the heaviness of oppression but 
people are also more than just their traumas and so this book was just a really great way to access these stories i've never read any stories by any bedouin palestinian so i hope to read more from this author there's magical realism the stories feel like autobiographical i think she even uses her name in one of the stories so i'm sure that they're based on true life my favorite three stories in this book would probably have to be Um Kulthum's Intercessor. Oh, and to make that fun, I'll show you the illustration for it. This one is about this grandmother who's obsessed with this edition singer. Like, she cannot stop listening to her music. And I don't think I can say anymore, but it's a story for super fans or the children of super fans, and I know I am one. My second favorite story is like two pages long. It's called Sola Cities. I can't tell you what it's about, but I'll show you a little picture. My last favorite story is Serpent, and that one is about a woman who is i believe she's getting like washed after she passes away and she has a serpent tattoo in her body and things happen i feel like even my notes won't do this book justice so i'm just gonna keep it at that if you do end up reading it please dm me on instagram or like leave a comment because i would love to hear your thoughts on which were your favorite stories next we're gonna move on to some literary fiction both of these literary fiction books have an element of fantasy or magical realism. The first one that I want to talk about is Sea Change by Gina Chung. This one I also audiobooked. I feel like all the books I read, except for maybe the previous book I talked about, I audiobooked for the most part. And this book is really melancholy. It is about a 30 year old woman whose boyfriend has left her to go on a mission to Mars. He's going to be part of a group of people who are moving away from earth because earth is basically inhospitable or is about to become inhospitable she's depressed she had a very rocky home life uh, she's korean american her parents are korean her father was a scientist and something happened there is strange her relationship with her mom is also very complicated the main character's name is ro and she is a heavy drinker and what keeps her going every day is going to the aquarium where she works and hanging out with this giant octopus named Dolores. So Ro gets really really attached to Dolores and turns out they've known each other since Ro was really really young and Ro is just going through shit. <laughs> the beginning of the book really gave me writers and lovers vibes. It was just so perfectly sad. Like I said there are some slightly speculative elements to the story even though it's mostly realistic. Like for example there's this dating app that that matches you based on your Google searches and your likes across social media. And yeah, that really sounds creepy, but it's also really believable. I can totally see that happening in the future. The book is divided into the past and the present. So you get to see Ro coping with losing her boyfriend and dealing with an existence that doesn't feel fulfilling because she's finding out that the octopus that she loves is potentially getting sold. And she's just really sad. And so we get to see her cope with that. And the other timeline is the past and like everything that happened with her family. Now it sounds like really plot heavy, but it wasn't. It was just a very vibey, go with the flow book. Not much happens and like at the end, nothing gets neatly tied with a bow or anything like that. So if you're into books where that happens, where there's like a clear ending, like you might not like this one, but if you want a vibey book, this was solid. I wouldn't call it a favorite, but I just wanted to read a book about a woman in her 30s. So that's what I checked out. I actually have her other book checked out from the library. It's a collection of short stories. It's titled Green Frog. And my camera is overheating, so I'll be back in a second. Okay, we're back in business. So the next literary fiction book that I read was This Is How You Lose a Time War by Amal L. Mozart and Max Gladstone. I also talked about this book in my springtime vlog, and I think I talked about it more extensively than I did They Felt Like Stars from the Sky, so I don't want to say too much, but it is a spy versus by enemies to lovers, epistolary sapphic romance that is short, that is beautifully written. The authors took turns writing the different parts. The two characters are spies, like I said, and one is red and one is blue, and they write gorgeous letters to one another. The book is very hazy, like I don't know what is going on. It's a, the kind of book that you just vibe with and maybe you reread it a couple years later and maybe you'll understand a little bit more. I was thinking about this book and whether or not it fits the literary fiction definition and I feel like I don't even know what literary fiction is 
This book is certainly crafted really beautifully, so I would absolutely consider it literary fiction, even though it is science fiction as well. If you watched my vlog, you'll see that I read a huge portion of this while I was lost at sea, and that also added to the vibe. And so if you're looking for a book that's vibey, romantic, kind of difficult to understand, then you might really like this one. So the next section that we're gonna talk about is romance. So I read two Emily Henry books this particular month. I was going through a hard time in April. My sister moved from Boston to Miami. I'm really excited to visit her, but I miss her so much. And so I just needed things that would numb my brain. And Emily Henry books do just that, but also just are very enjoyable to me. In particular, like the audiobook versions. They're narrated by Julia Whelan, and she's one of my favorite audiobook narrators. So much love to Julia. The first Emily Henry book I read was Funny Story. Thank you to Libro for giving me an advanced listener copy as part of their influencer program. I started this book on a rainy day and I ended it that same day even though I had work. And I like, I'm a teacher so <laughs> I can't listen to the audiobook while I'm teaching. So I spent like every waking moment that I was not teaching listening to this audiobook and I enjoyed the shit out of it. I am looking at my notes and I wrote that this might be my favorite Emily Henry book ever but I always say that after reading all her books because I just enjoy them so much. So I don't know if it will stick with me but it definitely made me really really emotional and <laughs> I, I, just, I just really liked the dynamics between the characters. So what is this book about? Bear with me here as I try to recall character names. So this book is about a librarian named Daphne who moves across the country with her fiance, Peter. They live in Peter's house. The house is under his name. Peter has a best friend and her name is Petra, I think. And, <laughs> and Petra and Peter end up getting together. I think Peter leaves Daphne right after his bachelor party. Uh, this is all in the synopsis, so I'm not spoiling anything. So then Daphne has nowhere to go. She's in this town or city where she doesn't really know that many people she really mostly keeps to herself and so she ends up living with petra's ex-boyfriend whom petra left because she wanted to be with peter and so petra's ex-boyfriend is now daphne's roommate and his name is miles i think i did a good job i hope i did a good job i think i'd give myself a c <laughs> uh what else i felt like the setting was really well done. I feel like they live in a seaside town, but maybe they don't. Daphne's a librarian, so like the library setting and Miles works at a winery, so that's also, it just felt like the vibes were there. <laughs> I don't know how to explain it. There's a fake dating trope, which honestly, I don't know if I was a fan of before this. So one night, Daphne is wasted and she RSVPs to Peter and Petra's wedding. And like, why would they even invite her? Like, that's so dumb, right? And she, ends up saying she's taking Miles as her plus one so they start fake dating. So that was really fun. It, I don't think that it dragged for very long The that trope. I think once it was over it was over and they were in it for reals. I also loved that um <laughs> that the romance was funny like their first kiss is a total disaster i also really enjoyed the exploration of the flaws in our memories i think that's one of like the big themes how we might remember the past one way but our siblings might remember our past the other way especially when people have shared memories depending on like what role you were asked to take on as a member of the family. I also think it's really interesting and I have a theory that Miles' sister was named Julia after Julia Whelan because Emily Henry must love Julia Whelan. I mean I would if she narrated my books, if I wrote books. I also really enjoyed the dynamics between Daphne and Miles. She is really guarded and he is just so likable. I think typically in romance novels where the couple is a man and a woman, the roles are reversed. And so here that was that was fun. It was a change of pace. I also absolutely adored the family dynamics in this book. For me, I won't get emotional over star-crossed lovers, but I will get emotional over like family disappointments and like things going wrong in someone's family. I don't know why. I have like sobbed in K-dramas so many times because of this. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I really liked it. It's like a healing book. Unfortunately, there is a third act breakup here and sometimes the love of your life will disappoint you. It's part of having well-rounded characters. I still really like the book in spite of that. I want to reread most of Emily Henry's books. So let's go on to the next one that I read. The next romance novel that I read was also an Emily Henry book and it was 
the people we meet on vacation. Last August when I went to Mexico City, I got this on Kindle and I decided to TNF it because I feel like one of the opening scenes or maybe the opening scene, the main character is at a bar and her love interest approaches her and she goes like, hey tiger. And I was like, even if you're like, even if you're joking around, it just like, it just gave me the egg. <laughs> So I decided to check this one out on audio because I thought if it was narrated by the incomparable Julia Whelan that I would love it. The story follows Poppy and Alex who have been BFF since college. Poppy is like a, I think she's a magazine writer who goes on vacation. She has like a popular Instagram account. She and Alex have this tradition of going on vacations once a year until one ill-fated summer. Now, I thought this premise was delicious, but I feel like the execution was extremely cringy. I thought the jokes and the banter were really try hard. There was this whole thing about Alex having like a sexy look that he gives people and it just kept getting repeated over and over and over again and I just, I don't know, I think it was her second book and I also hated her first beach read so maybe she's just gotten better but honestly it was difficult to finish because I was so icked out by it. Poppy also was like super annoying and not in a oh my god I'm so flawed kind of way but like in a yeah. The characters honestly reminded me of that one book that has a very fallish cover that I will put somewhere here. I just I just can't deal sometimes with unlikable characters, especially when they're not supposed to be unlikable. It just wasn't my cup of tea. The other thing that annoyed me was that Alex is a high school English teacher, but they just kept mentioning how he had a PhD because, you know, being a high school teacher isn't enough. I hate that. <laughs> but yeah, read to Emily Henry's, loved funny story, deeply disliked, the people we meet on vacation and my camera is overheating again so brb the next section's fantasy i feel like i read one fantasy book every once in a while because sometimes i like to escape and i actually read two this month because i was trying to escape <laughs> and the first one of these was a study in drowning by ava reed so i'm gonna be honest the first time i read emily wilde's encyclopedia of fairies i thought that i was reading this book because the girlies had been talking about both of the books and i actually bought emily wilde's encyclopedia of fairies and i started it and i was like wait isn't she like supposed to be fixing up a house but i really like that one so no regrets this book I got from the library, I listened to it, and truthfully I thought that it would be a big win for me because I love eerie atmospheres, I love haunted houses or houses that are creepy, I like fairy tale retellings, I like things that have a dash of romance, academic settings sometimes, and this book really felt flat for me unfortunately. So this book is about an architecture college student. Her name is Effie. She really wants to study literature. Unfortunately, because she is a girl or because she's a woman, she can't go to college and study literature for whatever reason. So she goes in for architecture, but is still using the library to learn more about her favorite fairy tale author. Lucky for her, there's this contest that she can enter. So it's, it's a contest for architecture students, and the winner is able to renovate the house of her favorite fairy tale author. So she's like, yeah, totally. I am going to win this contest and I will redo his house and that way I can dig up more information about him. Maybe there's information in his study or in his bedroom, whatever. And so she does end up winning the contest but when she does get to this mansion to fix up the house and to draft up a new structure for it she ends up meeting this literature student who's also there doing some research of his own. And so they're kind of like rivals and they reluctantly work together because it seems like the author has a deep dark secret. Even though this book wasn't my cup of tea, I totally love the atmosphere. I feel like if I had been physically reading this book, the pages would probably feel humid as I like turn them because the mansion was humid. It was dark, it was musty. It was wet, it was cold, it was really, really spooky. And so I totally felt that in my bones as I was listening to the audiobook and I legitimately got scared a couple of times. What didn't work for me is the fact that the characters were all cardboard boxes. Like I don't understand how you can write such beautiful atmosphere and write such shitty characters. Like Ava Reed really thought that she was doing something with her characters, especially Effie, who's supposed to be like a badass feminist. And honestly, like the dialogue and the romance 
months fell really flat for me the ending was not believable at all honestly i felt the same way about her other book that i read of hers i can't even remember the the title of it but i'll show it on the screen however in spite of everything i feel like i will absolutely be picking up her next book which is lady macbeth if i'm not mistaken and then unfortunately the other fantasy book that i read was the sequel to emily wilde's encyclopedia of fairies this one's called emily wilde's map of the other lands i really 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 liked emily wilde's encyclopedia of fairies i read it i believe in january and it really was so vibey i also physically read that one this one i audiobooked it it follows professor emily on an adventure with her niece ariadne another colleague of hers and of course when who is her academic rival slash love interest. I think what this book made me realize is that when I read fantasy, I don't want it to be fully cozy. Like, I like cozy fantasy that has some stakes in it. And I think that some people have said that Emily Wilde's Encyclopedia of Fairies didn't have any stakes, and I totally disagree. Like, there's a lot of danger in some of the scenes. This one just kind of felt flat for me. Like, nothing really happened. It just dragged. I don't know if it was my mental state or what. Maybe I didn't like the voice actors in the audiobook. I actually can't even remember if there was one or two. I think there were two voice actors. Yeah, I just, this one wasn't my cup of tea. I was really disappointed. I really waited four months to get this from the library and honestly I was just bored the footnotes were really long when you read it physically you can ignore the footnotes so maybe that was like my error I don't think the footnotes add anything really because she's supposed to be writing in a journal and like that's like her field notes for her study of fairies I just some of the stuff I don't care why do I need to know all these made-up facts about fairies that just don't really add to the story the conflict also just didn't do it for me I think this was a case of it it's me and not the story I should be more discerning when choosing fantasy books in the future. I have a goal for the remainder of the year and it's gonna be to DNF books sooner if I don't like them because I feel like this and A Study in Drowning both kind of put me in a slump. And I think we're in the last book and the last section which is nonfiction. Read one memoir, Heart Berries by Therese Marie Maylot. I was kindly gifted this by my friend Emma. I have noticed a trend this year where I'm not reading as much nonfiction as I'd like. Luckily, I started to pick up more memoirs because I feel like I really enjoy memoirs, which I hadn't been picking them up as much at the start of the year. So this one just started it all again. And this memoir is poetic, it's juicy, it's tragic, it's traumatic. It's also super edgy and it follows the life of an indigenous or first nations woman from canada as she like really grapples with her past and her current situations these traumas include poverty abuse just a lot of horrific things happen to her i would absolutely check the trigger warnings and she really struggles with mental health issues she actually wrote part of this memoir while she was committed in a mental institution and a lot of the book or maybe all of the book is written in second person she's writing to her then husband now ex-husband or then boyfriend who became her husband who is now her ex-husband but it's it's very intimate it's very unflinching worth it to note that the man that she's writing to is a white man and she like grapples with how she feels about that as well to be completely honest this book made me really uncomfortable and i think that sometimes it is nice to go out of our comfort zones i felt like it was really raw she wrote about her deepest darkest ugliest parts not just things that have happened to her but things that she herself and hurt that she herself has inflicted upon others she even shared how she conceived one of her children and i felt like that was a lot honestly more power to her that she was able to speak her truth and share both the joys and the hurts in her life she has been through so much and she keeps saying you know i should resist the urge to bleed on the page as an indigenous woman like you know i don't owe anyone anything and so i think she really is truly writing this book for herself as an exercise exercise in her own healing. I read this book really fast. It was gripping. I actually tandem read it and audiobooked it and I think what was interesting about that exercise is that as I was reading the book physically I noticed that it had been edited because the audiobook version mentioned Sherman Alexie a lot and that was before he had been added as a predator. He had even written the introduction to the book and he was named several times and the introduction was completely cut out. The blurb by him was completely cut out and instead of it saying Sherman Alexie had said my mentor and I came across an interview article where she said that as a book that centers like sexual trauma sexual assault 
it doesn't make sense to have someone who has been accused of sexual assault be in the book and it can be especially grating for her and for other readers who are survivors of sexual assault. Honestly, it was really overall very very powerful but also potentially very very triggering i honestly have mad respect for people especially women who are brutally honest and so i would absolutely give this a read if you are feeling up for it so just to give you a little taste of what her writing style is like in one part of the book she says my mother didn't feel like mine she taught me that i didn't own things i really like the idea of possession we don't own our mothers we don't own our bodies or our land Maybe I'm unsure. We become the land when we are buried in it. Our grandmothers have been uprooted and shelved in boxes, placed on slabs of plastic, or packed neatly into rooms, or turned into artifacts, all after proper burials. Indians aren't always allowed to rest in peace. I want to be buried in a bone garden with my ancestors someday. I'd like to belong to that. So those are my books, and now we are on to little joys, things that have brought me joy in the month of April. Honestly, I have no idea. <laughs> I want to keep this going. One of the things that continues to bring me joy is my junk journal. I will show a flip through. I've done like maybe four or four and a half collages, junk collages. This type of exercise has really made me appreciate the day to day. I love collecting ephemera like raffle tickets, wristbands, origami that my students have gifted me, menus from restaurants. It's just been really nice to romanticize my life in that way and just do something creative. I love to just watch YouTube videos and like zone out. I'm really into this Instagram account called Seb's Journal. I think Lit With Cat was the first one who I saw share him and I've just become obsessed with the way that he does things because it's not like, doesn't have to fully be aesthetic for it to be cool. And I'm thinking of incorporating some journaling things into my channel, but I'm also not very confident in my abilities. <laughs> but just art has been a balm in my life. It's really helped ground me and I feel silly calling it art, but it is art. I mean, what else are you going to call it? So just doing art in general, I am toying with the idea of doing the artist way, maybe in the fall or the summer, because I do like to work a different side of my brain. And I'm brain blocked at the moment, so I can't think of anything else. <laughs> But um, I think I have more for May. I think May was a more distinctive month for me and that will be upcoming. I'll, I'll have another recent reads video pretty soon. Yeah, so if you've made it this far, thank you so much for watching. Let me know if you've read any of the books that I talked about or if you have any recommendations for me based on those books. I hope that you are having a wonderful day and I will see you in my next video. Bye.